try to keep some concentration present for our last guest. And uh, my colleague, Richard, will, will introduce him. All right, guys, so last but not least. Our Belgian philosopher, art historian, writer, and activist published some dozen books on contemporary art, experience, and modernity, on Walter Benjamin, and more recently on architecture, the city, and politics. You may know him from his latest book, The Capsular Civilization, on the city of age of fear. Today, Leven de Kouter will present a recent mixed media, uh, sorry, a uh, recent mixed media project, and he will focus on the question, can we fall out of history? Is it possible that we are falling out of history, based on the text, Afterthoughts on Post-History? Ladies and gentlemen, Leven de Kouter. Welcome to Post-History. The age of realized science fiction. Uh, so uh, the overture is postscript to the future. I read a long quote. Is it possible that we are falling out of history? Is it possible that we are entering or have already entered something called post-history, a strange limbo after the end of history? Of course, there's common sense to save us. One cannot fall out of history uh, just as little as one can fall off the earth. But are we sure we cannot fall off the earth? The free fall uh, metaphor comes back here. Lately, we are maybe a bit more doubtful. Humanity is on a collision course with spaceship Earth. As we are hitting the limits of the ecosystem, one starts to wonder. We can fall off the Earth. At the very moment humankind starts hitting the limits of the ecosystem, the question of falling out of history seems less foolish. The idea of post-history as both the terminus and aim, the final state of history, has a long and rather impressive genealogy. Hegel, Marx, Cournot, Galen, Kozhev, and recently Fukuyama. For Hegel, post-history began once philosophy had understood that the subjective spirit and objective spirit were one and made the synthesis in absolute spirit, this process of awareness being the philosophy of Hegel himself. In more political terms, the German state was the final phase of history. For Marx, the end of history, as is well known, was not the bourgeois state, but the classless society. The withering away of the state the end of capitalist exploitation was a sort of materialist version of messianic redemption, the classless society as paradise on earth. The welfare state came close, and that is why Kozhev saw the Japanese consumer society uh, of the 70s as a neo-Hegelian form of post-history. The people had nothing left to do other than stimulate themselves with all sorts of gadgets. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jihad on screens is a slogan I designed for my daughters. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, before I start smash smashing this screen. Uh, but I, it, it still is with me because, of course, uh, we are more and more eaten uh, and swallowed by our screens. Anyhow, close to that, this was a footnote, close to that was the neoconservative uh, neo uh, vision of Fukuyama stating that liberal democracy had finally defeated its com competitors, fascism and communism, and capitalism would live happily ever after. The mathematician Cournot, a 19th century mathematician, believed that any system can find a lasting, or most systems can find a lasting equilibrium, and this he called the post-historical phase, and that he might be the inventor of the term post-history. Our post-history seems the exact opposite of all this. The system, the ecosystem to begin with, but also the political and economical system, seem to have lost all sense of equilibrium. All parameters are rampant, and all the attempts to change the parameters cause new problems. Our post-history seems more a chaotic or entropic universe 
where complexities are staggering and all equilibrium is gone. The system might change abruptly once tipping points are met. Tipping points is in red because uh, for the project that I will explain to you in a minute, uh, tipping points is uh, the key word. And of course, I think it is the key word in any thinking uh, today, in a sense. So uh, I was asked to make a lecture performance uh, based on this question, if you want, and the question became a sort of what I call a philosophical poem, which is uh, printed in, in the, the year program uh, of uh, the Burning Ice Festival, which is a, a festival on ecology and the crossroad between ecology and art. Um, so I, I will now sort of explain, as you are an, an audience uh, involved in art, I'd sort of explain or guide you through quickly through this work in progress, which is also a work on progress, uh, and which I then termed a work in progress. Uh, so the Burning Eyes exhibition lecture in collaboration with uh, quite a few people. Um, so um, the, the question that is at at the basis of this project is, of course, and, and of my whole work, and what the hell is the age of realized science fiction? And I did uh, investigate that in several books. I give you a few, uh, The Capsule Civilization uh, on the City uh, uh, in the Age of Fear, uh, which was a 2004 book, um, sort of basically written at the end of the, of the 20th century, sort of my millennium book, if you want. Uh, I tried to escape the darkness uh, of the capsule civilization into heterotopia, but it was still public space in a post-civil society. Um, art and activism, uh, the, the, the extremity of uh, the situation that I saw dawning on all levels, um, both um, population, ecology, uh, war on terror as state of exception, uh, the, the relapse into the state of nature, civil war engineering, etc., uh, sort of pushed me uh, towards uh, activism and studying activism. And that was the collective book, Art and Activism in the Age of Globalization. In the Everyday Apocalypse, I brought together 600 pages uh, for free uh, on the internet, uh, still uh, sort of collecting as a sort of a reply to Anders Bering Breivik's compendium, a compendium of my uh, decennium, if you want, or my decade, uh, the Everyday Apocalypse uh, from 9-11 to the Arab Spring, 2001-2011, uh, Chronicles of a Dark Age. And uh, then Entropic Empire um, uh, on the City of Man in the Age of Disaster 2012, which is the, the theoretical book inside this big uh, 600 pages compendium. And lately, uh, a sort of a sequel uh, to Entropic Empire, Meta Modernity uh, for Beginners, Philosophical Mimos for the New Millennium. But, um, the image has on the cover uh, uh, has started to live, if you want, and, and it was a light motif or a light build, if you want, uh, for to tackle this translation into installations. Because uh, quickly it, came, it became clear to me that I wanted to sort of translate uh, this question. So, so this age of realized science fiction was uh, encapsulated in this image, uh, which is a sort of steampunk in image. And indeed, I realized that we are f way behind in thinking our own time, and we are in fact still, uh, um, still uh, trapped, if you want, uh, into the steampunk age. As you can see, uh, it's, it's, it is 19th century science fiction, but they are still, so it is an air balloon, uh, so you could say it's sort of renewables, but you can clearly see it is uh, still stuck in fossil fuel burning. And we are all stuck uh, on all levels, micro-political, meso-political and macro-political on uh, fossil fuel and burning. Um, so we are stuck in this steampunk. So, and it became this sort of leitmotiv that I tried to translate with uh, others into uh, a sort of uh, artistic project. So first the poem which became a sort of very uh, contracted version. Uh, can we fall out of history? Um, that is the question. Can we? Common sense is there to save us. Like you cannot fall off the earth, you cannot fall out of history. Uh, no, you cannot. We are inside space and time always. Uh, can we not fall off the earth? As we are hitting the limits of the ecosystem, we are not so sure anymore. We might be falling out of history. Falling out of history? Yes, maybe. 
not so good, baby. So that became the poem, and then I sort of translate, I try to translate this philosophical poem uh, sort of in a public address, sort of looking for ways um, to spread the word, to disseminate the question, because I think it is one of the questions, if not the questions, uh, the question of our time over the city into public space, because uh, after so many books, uh, I just gave you a few. Uh, this was my 13th book, uh, Meta Moderniteit uh, for Beginners. Uh, books are limited. You feel, especially in Belgium, a bit lonely inside your books. So I wanted to break out of books, uh, mediating the message, going transmedia, uh, going artsy-fartsy uh, is better than going uh, berserk. Uh, which is uh, something, it's, it's another slogan that uh, might, might become part of this project. Uh, because uh, I, I have tendency, when I look at the world, to either go totally melancholic or go berserk. Um, and I, I hope, uh, in a sense, that I'm not the only one. So it, it first became a storyboard for a comic strip, uh, starting from the light build. Uh, Martina Svojkova, a student in animation, uh, sort of made a storyboard uh, where you can sort of reread the question. Uh, that, that was the first version where the whole question is in fact uh, sort of told. Um, she made a, uh, it, it worked okay, but we were not totally convinced. Then a third version where it was more uh, uh, sort of combined in three plates. Um, and um, then uh, uh, the, this third version was like a one-to-one -one, uh, attempt. Uh, can we fall out of history? That is the question. But we decided this was maybe due to the text being too abstract, it was not really, really working. Um, so maybe we thought we have to go for another medium, uh, slogans for the 21st century, uh, a t-shirt philosophy, uh, can we fall out of history, yes, maybe, not so good, maybe, didn't work. Uh, maybe this one, fuck format, uh, didn't work, it should be like this, so uh, this would be a better version, uh, fuck format, or uh, fuck format, jihad on screens, um, or this one, uh, pessimism in theory, which in fact uh, my daughter made for me for my Christmas. <laughs> so <laughs> it is already existing, this one. Uh, but it's maybe not yet uh, the, 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 the right one, uh, or the right form. So we're, we're thinking of a whole line uh, of production as it is a work in progress. Uh, so steampunk, it could be a fashion line. Uh, no, uh, a post-historical fashion trend, uh, meta modern bit of a, an inside joke here, uh, dress code, uh, eh, but because of course the question is where have all the subcultures gone? But anyhow, we decided to give that up for the time being uh, and go back to, to the question. And this will be it, in the, the 15th of February and, and for the whole festival, uh, there will be uh, moving screens. Uh, if I'm well informed, uh, that's what they called in, in English, uh, Lichtkranten, where the question and the poem, uh, maybe entirely, this is still has to be decided if it works, uh, what, uh, whatever works, in eight, the eight main languages of Brussels, uh, being French, uh, Dutch, uh, English, Arabic, uh, Spanish, Italian, uh, German, and Turkish. Uh, so so uh, this, this will be it. This is the, the this fantastic uh, space of the Kai Theater Studios. I hope I can spread maybe the project over these two spaces. But dear, here it will really be. This is decided, of, or admitted, um, that these uh, uh, boards will be put there. So, and, and of course, for me, it's quite fascinating. It's the first time to sort of step out of my books and my political activism and really so, sort of go uh, into a, a sort of what you could call installations and, and therefore a sort of art project. We will also uh, go, that, that will happen one of these days, there are already two students, one of radio and one of uh, uh, um, editing. Um, we will go into the streets and ask people to read in one of these eight languages the poem and then ask their reactions, a very sort of standard uh, format of media. But, but, and then we will make a montage of a sort of Stockhausen uh, meets Kubelka montage of these eight languages and of course see what happens, and maybe a circle of the eight, with eight uh, monitors, where you can listen to all these uh, languages, and when you're in the middle, you have the babble of the question. So all sorts of forms to, to spread this question. Um, um, 
And then the neons, which I now call eh, some answers to the questions. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this one was had the sort of great unanimity. The director of the Kai Theater uh, liked the slogan, so the idea was to make it into a sort of um, uh, a sort of neon uh, with with all sorts of uh, possibilities, of course. Um, and, and all, all sort of meanings, uh, of course, uh, uh, whether you light it up. But he then decided that it was too expensive to do. Uh, one meter on one meter, his estimate was 7,000 euros, and, and there was no space, etc., etc. So that was uh, in limbo. But anyhow, content-wise, uh, for me, the slogan is... is uh, uh, because, of course, it's, it's about form, but uh, in first, first instance, it, it, it should uh, try to convey, uh, for me, uh, this, this content and, and trigger uh, it. It is exactly the awareness that things go wrong that forces me again and again, and I hope also you, to become an activist. So for me, it, it's the slogan sort of is there. It's, it's a slogan I live with. Uh, literally, so it's, it's the first time maybe that I wear it on my uh, chest, but it's a, a slogan uh, that I think can help us also. Because uh, it, it's not just a slogan, but even an evening prayer uh, and a battle cry. Because of course we have this uh, predominant idea, which is everywhere, that you, ha you need a positive story, you need a wervend verhaal, a, a, a sort of attractive story, otherwise people uh, sit down. I, do, I, I think that's, that's over, that's, that's old, old school in my opinion. Uh, we have five centuries of optimism uh, on uh, yeah, modernity is optimist, so, so I think we should uh, change uh, gear and, and go for uh, what Henk uh, has called a post-apocalyptic hands-on approach. And I, I think uh, this uh, pessimism in theory, optimism in practice uh, uh, captures that uh, well, in my opinion. Uh, to, to be frank and, and a bit academic, the so slogan has antecedents. Uh, uh, I am a pessimist because of intelligence, uh, but an optimist because of will, Antonio Gramsci. Uh, but I, I will not go into it. I think it's still a, a big uh, difference, and it's also attributed to others. So, and I'm rather pleased if others sort of have a similar uh, idea. Um, another s slogan that is dear to me, and, and I sort of think of how to translate it and how to bring it into public space, is lessons in urgency, exercises in globalization, uh, sort of trying it out. Uh, uh, now it's, it's all this uh, um, in the video, uh, in the sort of neon, sorry. Um, it could be that the next one is more uh, this sort of electronic board version. Uh, I didn't have the patience to try to imitate this uh, uh, on PowerPoint for the time being. Uh, uh, urbanity or civil war uh, is the end of a text uh, on, on, on urbanity. Um, but as, as it is not well known as a term, unfortunately, I try to sort of explain it. Politeness or implosion of the police, uh, uh, policing or explosion of the police, urbanity or civil war. So that would be uh, on uh, the screens. Maybe I, I try to push it uh, in, in the Kai Theater just to try it out. Um, my most optimistic answer to the question is this one, and this is a sort of lecture in the lecture uh, um, on utopia, because I thought if I'm too pessimistic, uh, all these youngsters will go home depressed. So it's time for a bit of optimism, and I have to <coughs> stay uh, true to my own slogan. <coughs> so here for some optimism. And it's also, uh, it has links to what has been said before, as you will see. Utopia needs to be revisited in the light of the new wave of enclosures of the commons. The new wave of enclosures and the rediscovery of the commons form a crucial constellation of our time. The new, this new wave have been called uh, of enclosures, Silent Theft, The Private Plunder of Our Commonwealth, a book by David Bollier. I think it, it captures the thing well. The new wave of enclosures is, of course, nothing else than the privatization and commodification of everything. Uh, privatization is theft. I, I would love to see that on the Kai Theater, uh, because it's just opposite a bank. Uh, you will see it in a minute. Uh, to make this very uh, old slogan, because of course it's uh, clearly referring to Proudhon, uh, a bit concrete, you have the Monsanto and the, the GMO struggle. All over the world people protest against Monsanto and others uh, for the, the, the practices of privatization. 
Monsanto and other multinational corporations privatized seeds, a common good of mankind, a universal commons we shared for thousands of years. I think uh, this is quite a bit of a crime, in fact. Uh, in the center, you see Barbara van Dijk. There was a potato war uh, at Wetteren, which triggered, uh, in fact, uh, a whole debate uh, in Belgium and, and a whole uh, criminalization. She was sacked, sacked from university. We made a committee. It's a story and a half in itself. That is also how I met uh, the philosopher whom Henk referred to, Isabel Stengers, who is also very committed in this affair. And of course, this uh, went on, uh, the GMO event, as she calls it, made us aware of a series of enclosures, not only the privatization of seeds, but also the privatization of knowledge and the neoliberalization of academia, not to forget the criminalization of activism, which is one of my topics in the post 9-11, or has been, unfortunately, one of my obliged topics in the post 9-11 era, because many activists have been criminalized in the most outrageous way. Good came from it. We wrote the Slow Science Manifesto. Science is not a business. I think it sounds very uh, familiar in the, the lowlands and, and also in Holland. Uh, uh, and education and science for all, knowledge as commons. And I think commons is, is the key word, in fact, in my opinion. Slow science now was a sort of uh, slogan. As the commons are under threat, we become aware of the commons. It's, it's also a slogan that I quite uh, like, in, in a sense, uh, because it, it has this circular thing uh, and it links the, the, the threat of the commons with the awareness of the commons. Because the rediscovery of the commons, I think, is, is one of the most important events, positive events of our age, if you talk from the 90s onwards, it was an emergency, but also an emergence, a constellation. The open source movement, we have referred to it, uh, maybe it's already uh, uh, co-opted, but it's still there and it's not so easy to co-opt, I think. Eleanor Ostrom and after, uh, the other globalist protest, urban activism, peer-to-peer, etc. The commons are back uh, because they have been forgotten for ages, if not centuries, uh, if not five centuries, as, as I will try to show in a minute. As creative commons, as urban commons, as self-organization, as digital commons, as cooperative repair cafes, fab labs and the like. Um, Morris, uh, Thomas More protested 500 years ago against the first wave of enclosures. Uh, and as it is now the year of Morris, uh, uh, there will be all sorts of books uh, on Morris. I, I sort of look forward uh, to this, this commemoration. Enclosures, that's the origin of the term, is the fencing off of farmland and destroying entire villages uh, for the grazing of sheep. So you have to, in, in fact, think ethnic cleansing, if you look at the landscape, it, it is a landscape of ethnic cleansing, only it's economical cleansing, it is a crime that uh, is uh, of unseen proportions. Uh, and he, uh, Thomas More, uh, who clearly uh, explains to the reader that he's a, a figure of law, uh, saw it as a double crime, namely disappropriation and criminalization of the poor. And this disappropriation and criminalization of the poor is, of course, ongoing. Uh, in, in this second uh, or third wave of enclosures that we live and we call now neoliberalism. But anyway, when we revisit and reread Utopia in the light of the new wave of enclosures and the rediscovery of the commons, which of course are linked in a sense, we can redefine the concept. Utopia. Utopia is a radical response to the enclosures of the commons. And I do think, uh, I, I love this formula, why? Because it, it goes beyond totalitarianism, everything that we have associated uh, with utopia for ages, uh, we can sort of reinvent utopia from the rereading of this 500-year-old uh, book uh, of um, Morris. Uh, I have just written two texts on it. And then, of course, I try again to translate that uh, into uh, optimist, maybe, response, activist response, uh, but anyhow, an imaginative response to the enclosures of the commons. Now to reality. Um, maybe I should uh, try and go to the arrows. I don't know. Or, or if my cursor is here. A bit. It's, I think the machinery is, is not uh, easy. Uh, anyhow, uh, he, Rijpers, uh, the director of um, Kai, said, no, no, we won't do uh, the, the, the neon. Uh, I have a better idea. We will do it here. Here. And we made already uh, a sort of simulation. 
that is how it will look. I, I must say it's a really an entrance uh, of Brussels. Uh, no, I cannot. Can I go back? No, I cannot. Maybe I can. Uh, no. Yeah. I want to go back, yes. Just, just to show uh, here, you can see uh, here. Yes, yeah, really. But anyhow, so here you can see the canal, and you can here is the Pentagon of Brussels. So you, anybody entering Brussels will see this. So it's really at the gate of Brussels, at one of the gates of Brussels. So it is a, a glorious spot, and, and it is a non-conspicuous -con building. You, you never look at it, and it is, of course, with uh, Kai Theater and uh, the Citroën uh, site, which will become a museum of contemporary art. It is a very strategic site, so, so I'm very happy to, for my first attempt to, to sort of move out of books, break out of books, to do that in such a monumental way with a slogan that is so dear to me. So it, it will probably be a line, of course, same lettering, because now the blue lettering uh, is, is in fact too small. But anyhow, I think the simulation uh, uh, gives uh, a lot to hope. Uh, it, if it's not realized, I always tell myself it can be uh, just a desktop uh, background or a screensaver. <laughs> you have to be uh, a bit optimistic uh, in a relativist way. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, but then, of course, I thought, um, I go to this colloquium, I must say, of course, the word collapsology uh, spoke to my imagination. I have not uh, done my homework like Heng did, uh, had too, money, too, too much uh, other things to do, uh, but the word uh, spoke to my imagination and I sort of uh, made some notes for you on collapsology. Zero, I think the word is a bit of a bad joke uh, in the sense that it is a bit like first-class passenger on a Titanic philosophizing on icebergology. Uh, <laughs> I think so. And, and there is a tendency in culture. I, I, uh, a few years ago, there was a, a, a colloquium in Ghent called, and it has been a book uh, in, in recent times, uh, f sort of later. Uh, it's called Tickle Your Catastrophe, of course, which is a sort of word game on tackle your catastrophe. And then, in fact, this uh, Burning Ice Festival was first called uh, Tipping Thrill. You see, so the sort of frivolity of, of making... Uh, a sort of joke or a, so, or a sort of, how would I say, a sort of designing collapse, no? I, I find that a bit um, uh, problematic. But of course you could say, with my project, Welcome to History, I do exactly the same thing. But anyhow, um, but at least it is an urgent theme. Uh, we are on a Titanic precisely because the ancient iceberg, of course, are melting. First, the beginnings of collapsology, uh, the awareness, the warning of collapse uh, has been explained by uh, Henk, uh, but the quote is something to keep in mind forever uh, or, and a day. Um, the behavior of the world system under the business as usual model is that of overshoot and collapse. 72, very important book. This is the graph we could see in Henk's presentation too. Uh, this is the quote in its literalness. I, I sort of helped you a bit. Uh, the behavior uh, mode of the system shown in figure 45, uh, uh, the 35 is that is clearly of overshoot and collapse. And we are, of course, still in this overshoot and collapse mode, unfortunately. The overshoot is just going on. We cannot stop it. Two, just a sort of different angle on collapsology, um, end time crazes and post-history fantasies are back with a vengeance. And for me, they make a sort of constellation of our time to be investigated, so it's just a note in all sorts of forms, some sinister. I think neoconservatism is particularly sinister. I have written a lot about this. Uh, and the, for instance, just think of the plan to make, to remake the Middle East. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just the, this, the plan to remake the Middle East. This is what they are now doing. Do eh? you destroy Iraq? You destroy uh, Syria? That's the plan to remake the Middle East. That's the neoconservatives. So sinister uh, beyond words. Some weird. We have seen very good examples of the uh, in the lectures of uh, cryonics and, and transhumanism. The singularity, uh, uh, accelerationism, which I, I think is weird, um, uh, not to take to be taken seriously. But of course, um, we can discuss that. Uh, I have called it all as a sort of group technopantheism, uh, the becoming of God via technology. And I think it's deeply, deeply theological, very deeply theological. Um, 
that's, but of course that's a lecture in itself, some gruesome, all fundamentalisms, with IS as its extreme and the rapture index as its caricature. Uh, how do they relate? Do they relate? Uh, in a sense, they do. Um, and here you have the singularity uh, the, that uh, all our artificial intelligence machines will, uh, by 2045 exactly, uh, be more clever than all the human brains combined. Um, I, I do believe with McLuhan that we accelerate, that every medium is a response to the acceleration of a former medium, but uh, McLuhan was clever enough not to see the becoming of God from that. So uh, this is a, a, a very different, but, but also very much a sort of end craze uh, is of course Islamic State. You cannot understand the radicality uh, of Islamic State without uh, understanding uh, its um, its apocalyptic creed, and the big, the magazine itself, is in fact uh, based on this uh, uh, a key uh, site in Muslim uh, mythology. Uh, and what, the, uh, what they really want, uh, the quote is clear, the Islamic State awaits the army of Rome, uh, whose defeat at Dabiq, Syria, will initiate the countdown to uh, apocalypse. So, in fact, the, the, when you say, well, why are, are they doing these uh, terrorist attacks? Because they want the armies to come. So Hollande saying, we're now at war, that's exactly what's, what uh, the IS wants them to do. Because they really believe that uh, the, 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 the world will be decided in Syria. So it's, it is the end of times. That's why they destroy, uh, they, they kill, they, so they have to purify. It has been here too, eh? Uh, they have to purify themselves, but also mostly the non-believers, and, and of course uh, they have to be iconoclastic uh, and destroy all the sites that have been surviving uh, for thousands of years. Uh, there's also a funny, funny version of that. I don't know if you know this one, the Rapture Index. Uh, it is an index now at 70, uh, 179, higher than yesterday. Um, and uh, it has false cries, occult satanism, in fact, all sorts of catastrophes. Uh, I give you a few here. Uh, drug abuse, recreational marijuana legalized in Washington, uh, the world will end. Um, or moral standards, a new poll finds that more couples are living together outside of marriage, the world will end. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> they believe uh, that the, like the purpose of this index says the rapture index has two functions. One is to factor together a number of related end time components into a cohesive indicator, and the other is to standardize those components to eliminate the wide variants that currently exist with prophecy reporting. The rapture index is by no means meant to predict the rapture, the rapture meaning that uh, all the born-again Christians, 50 million Americans, are lifted outside, uh, out of their clothes, go directly to heaven, which will happen very close to Syria. In Israel, all the Israelis who do not convert uh, to Christianity will be killed, like all the, all the non-believers, and, and uh, that will be the end of the world. <laughs> um, so that's the rapture, uh, the ecstasy, if you want. However, the index is designed to measure uh, the, f the type of activity that could act as a precursor of the rapture. You could say that the rapture index is the Dow Jones Industrial Average of end-time activity, but I think it would be better if you viewed it as a prophetic speedometer. The higher the number, the faster we are moving towards the occurrence of pre-tribulation rapture. Rapture index uh, uh, of 100 and below, slow prophetic activity, etc., etc. Uh, rapture index above 160, we are at above 160, fasten your seatbelts. 50 million born again Christians, who of course oppose all measures against uh, climate change. So it is a joke, but unfortunately it's a very, very, very uh, sad one. Three. Uh, this is an era of psychotic politics. This is an essay I, I want to sort of write uh, soon. It, it's there in bits and pieces, but I, I, I think it's time to sort of uh, write one essay on it. I think uh, psycho uh, pathological psychopolitics, as, as uh, uh, Sloterdijk calls it, uh, is, is, is on. We are in, in a psycho uh, politics, like in psychotic politics. Uh, megalomania, uh, religious delusion, uh, we have seen a few here. Uh, paranoia, uh, to think of the army in soporific uh, Belgium in the streets. Um, it doesn't help one iota, it's just paranoia, it's just for the, the theater of terror. Uh, epidemic screen narcissism, um, 
uh, political melancholy. I've written on that in, in uh, my latest book, uh, uh, Metamodernity. Uh, and above all, uh, and that's my point for today, schizophrenic politics. It, and, and that's really something that we have to tackle and we cannot for some reason. It is a generalized cognitive disjunction being a brain split, really, really you have to see it like a brain split between politics and economics. It is in everything, it is in the newspaper, it is in the workings of our real political economy uh, of, of our system, it, it, the logic of growth, the innovation as motor of planned obsolescence, etc. And it is also in our daily lives uh, and our own psyche. I give you two examples of this split. Um, on the 8th of December, during uh, the summit in Paris, you have, of course, uh, uh, oil does not um, uh, work anymore, uh, climate conference, and, and uh, the, 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 the BRICS uh, ask, ask money from uh, the West, let's say. At the same, the, the same, so the whole theme of climate change, the same uh, newspaper, uh, uh, eight of, uh, but I first give you the image by an artist, which is quite an image of accelerationism uh, and, and uh, density. Uh, Europe wants to um, arm uh, the, the air flight sector against the Arabs. It's about growth, it's about competitivity, not one word on the same day during the conference, not one word on ecology, not one. A more recent example, yesterday in fact, I, was just, I had just finished, uh, and I was very happy, my uh, PowerPoint, this PowerPoint, and suddenly I, I read uh, the newspaper then, uh, and you, you saw that uh, on the left, uh, climate change uh, and migration are the biggest dangers, which is the report that uh, is, is given to, as a sort of basis for discussion in Davos. So you think, uh, uh, you think finally the, 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 it is sinking in into the brains of the suckers who fuck up our world. That's what I thought. Yeah, I have been uh, uh, listening a lot to Eminem, so I try to, to wrap it a bit also. But it, it's exactly what I was thinking, no? Because in Davos... Uh, but uh, on the uh, right side, uh, it was about connected cars. Uh, and connected cars and, and the CEO of... Uh, of uh, Proximus, uh, she explained she was at, at the opening of the car uh, salon, as we call it, uh, auto salon, and um, whatever it would be called, the, the car fair, and uh, she said, if we connect our cars, uh, tra internet traffic is already doubling, uh, but then it will, it will explode, because of every car is, is an internet hub, um, and it, it will cost billions, but again, not a word about the ecological footprint. So, so, and this is, of course, very clear in the media, uh, but it reflects uh, politics. You have the, the political blah blah, and you have the politi and the economical reality, and we disconnect all the time, as we do uh, in our daily lives too. So, it is really something uh, of our system. So, it's everywhere, and I think uh, Hank has, has given us a few clues of how to overcome. Uh, this this uh, cognit cognitive disjunction that we all have, but I'm not so sure if we will manage in time. Uh, so then you realize uh, that uh, nope, it was just another claptrap for shutting up during the annual skiing trip, Davos. Anyhow, um, collapsology in practice is a quote that I found via this colloquium because I was uh, searching this quote digitally on collapse and overshoot, which has been on my head for years. Uh, and suddenly I, I saw a very recent comment uh, of somebody who says the Club of Rome, in spite of what everybody has always said, was right. And this, this quote is quite something. Preparing for a collapsing global system could be even more important than trying to avoid collapse. Uh, it's Graham Turner, so I give you the quote, but the footnote is, is almost worth reading in itself. Regrettably, and that's the long quote, the alignment of data trends with the limited to growth dynamics indicate that the early stages of collapse could occur within a, a decade and might even be underway. This suggests, from a ras rational risk-based perspective, that we have squandered the past decades and that preparing for a collapsing system, sorry, global system, could be even more important than trying to avoid collapse. For, for me, that is, uh, for, was the quote uh, that, that makes me think uh, for uh, quite a bit. 
how to prepare, how to tackle this ecological overshoot. What should have been an age of transition turns out to be the age of extreme energy, as uh, Naomi Klein calls it. Tar sand, oils, fracking, deep, sorry, deep sea drilling. I have to go back again. Yes, deep sea drilling, uh, etc. And how to tackle the extremes of politics today, uh, another sort of obsession of mine, namely the war on terror as permanent state of exception, which is, of course, now everywhere. It's spreading. I just, it was over, but it's, in fact, just beginning. And the relapse into the state of nature being uh, the spreading of latent low-intensity civil war and or other civil war and even hidden civil war engineering like in Iraq or Syria. These are the big, big, big questions of our time. And I have uh, not... Uh, complete answers, but to end again uh, in optimism, uh, we need radical counter-programs. And I think some of it has been discussed today. On a micro-political le level, practices of commoning, global, uh, global activism, uh, like you could say that uh, uh, skill city is very much su such a practice of commoning, um, and it has been uh, this uh, circulationism, you can discuss it. I think it's too formal. I think the commons are a better content uh, approach. Uh, and on a micro-political scale, it's easy to say, but difficult to do an international legal order under the sign of the protection of the commons. Voila, thank you. Thank you. We're going to have our final questions and then round it up. Anyone energy? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, we have been talking about mapping, so it needs a mapping before you can connect different, on different scales and different levels, all these initiatives or even the full-grown uh, uh, projects that have been lasting for 10 or 20 years now. So, and uh, to, to my experience, for instance, I'm in a, in, a, in a board for a contest for the radical innovator in Holland, young people that send in their practice, artists, designers, but also people working in mm. neighborhoods. Mm. And it is quite interesting what is really done already and what is possible. Mm. So my, my, my point always is that we don't need to find new uh, technological uh, processes or technological inventions. Everything is there already. The whole problem is, of course, the monopolies and the lobbies of big uh, corporations or big institutions that do not allow their uh, interests to be interfered by those kind of projects. Mm. So how do you... So that's on a macro-political level. So on the meso-political level and the micro-political level, it's... everything is there, right? Mm. So I saw uh, things like, um, for instance, one, one example, there's a, a guy that developed a crusher of pet bottles, pet flesser, right? You put it in front of your classroom and it crushes the pet, uh, the, the material and then uh, molds it again into Lego stones. And you use the Lego stones in the curriculum to give them uh, instructions on how to develop this kind of... So, so it's a closed circle. And there's another uh, initiative where the designer design, uh, uh, use those sensors and uh, you can put in your USB, USB stick into your uh, uh, window pane, for instance. It's possible, you know, the infrastructure is possible. But the big problem are the corporations and the big political powers. Mm -hmm. They do not allow to demaximize their interests. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to tackle that? Yeah. <laughs> we, we've been do, trying to do this for the past 15 years. Yes, yes. Uh, well, that's the, the, the that's the question. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's of course it's also the question of, of uh, Naomi Klein's fantastic book. Uh, uh, this changes everything. Uh, the, the capitalism versus the climate. Uh, yeah, but in the end, I mean, the only fact, the, the only thing that you can really say that she is sure of that, uh, as we have uh, abolished slavery, we can abolish this sort of rogue capitalism. Yeah, I mean, th there's not a path, uh, unfortunately, I, I mean, I think, uh, like on the question of revolution, um, there's not one path, I mean, the many strategies um, is, is the only thing, I mean, and of course I hope, uh, for instance, to be very concrete, that uh, 
Podemos, we were just discussing with some people in the audience, uh, uh, Spanish architects who, who came here. Um, uh, so Podemos, Syriza, uh, Hart Boven Hart, uh, the Portuguese uh, government, that, that the, this whole uh, neoliberal frenzy that we have seen uh, uh, swiping over, over Europe uh, it comes to a halt and that we can sort of restart to say, okay, Europe can, for instance, uh, keep GMOs definitely out of uh, and, and give chances to, to, this, to the commons and to the local in initiatives, etc., etc. Of course, I, I remain, unfortunately, uh, close to my slogan. Uh, in theory, I, I remain an opt uh, a pessimist in the sense that I don't see it happening. Uh, that's why, why I wrote very early on uh, that uh, looking at the 21st century is, uh, unfortunately, and, and that's, that's almost very close to, um, to uh, an expression that I, I read later in, uh, in Isabel Stenger's, uh, it will be an exercise in, in speechlessness. She uses the term, uh, uh, the experience of perplexity. So, so um, for me, as a philosopher, I, I cannot sort of say I have the solution. Um, uh, it, it will be the many, the many uh, social movements, uh, like the other globalist movement, was a sign of hope and a moment of hope. Uh, I think all this sort of urban farming uh, and this, this uh, sort of cyclical economies that, that you gave examples of and that happen in Brussels and all over the place, are signs of hope. I, I have been involved in Park Farm, which is similar. It is uh, um, sort of mix, it is doing two things. It, it has this short, short uh, circles uh, of, of um, a sort of uh, uh, not only growing uh, food but also cooking together and therefore mixing a very mixed neighborhood. Uh, human waste is is uh, uh, recuperated in the dry toilet that can then be used. Uh, in, in a sort of year as, as hummus. So, so this idea of uh, uh, a sort of, uh, if you want, uh, metabolism, uh, an urban metabolism uh, with nature, uh, I think are all very important uh, initiatives. Of course, they are tiny against the, the gigantic power of the corporations. Uh, and, and there I fully agree that this is the one uh, million dollar question, so to speak. Um, and I don't think for the time being there is a methodology to say that's the way we will do it. Um, yeah, it's yeah, making it's big coalitions. I mean, I, I, yeah. I do think that if, uh, it, it will have to be via politics somehow. But why, for instance, in international law now, there's one lawyer that tries to install an initiative mm -hmm. on eco side. Yeah. So the yeah. killing of yes. ecosystem, yes. No. which in retro uh, yes. respect well, can yes. get a lot of people yes. into jail. Yes. No, but of course. No, no, I do believe, uh, maybe uh, this, if I, this is what I try to uh, say, although, um, how would I say, to, to implement it, is uh, in fact reinventing the UN, or at least uh, reinventing the idea of, uh, for instance, like with Ecocide, um, the, uh, reinventing the idea that you can make a sort of declaration like uh, we made a declaration of, of human rights, a declaration of the rights of the commons, which you then can defend and you can criminalize. I, th I think, for instance, the enclosures should be criminalized because the, uh, the land grabbing that uh, Moore, saw, Moore saw happening is happening today uh, in Brasilia, uh, all, all over the place. So, but we don't have names, uh, uh, juridical names uh, as yet. Uh, for instance, if the terms ecocide or e economic cleansing would exist, or, or enclosure as a crime, uh, it, we, would, we would have a sort of different system. And I do think that legal work and activism can, can really be combined there. Thank you very much. Sorry. As we're running out of time, yes. one more question. Well, maybe I have a question. Well, um, used mainly today is about speed and acceleration. And what I'm... Um, no, slow it. science is also one. So, yes, but speed can go either, yeah, or to <laughs> slow down, or uh, to have a free fall, um, or a crash, or a collapse. And um, uh, now I became a bit into a vertigo of where to go. There's no more backward. We don't have a force with the speed. 
and I was uh, asking uh, myself while I was listening to you about crime and people who are stealing, what are the moral grounds we stand on? To who it is a crime? To who is the crime committed? And I think that uh, as long as we keep that in mind, we might know our vector from which we can make a new momentum, maybe. But I'm also um, uh, thinking that maybe all acceleration um, will lead to a collapse. So maybe we just, what do you think about having a sustainable movement in some sort instead of perpetual growth, which we have now in our finance system. It's not an economic system, it's a financial system. Um, um, how do you see that in that uh, sense? From how do we, it's not, yeah, from how to where do we move? I'm getting lost in the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, my, my idea is about, um, uh, about to find a new momentum in which collapse does not take part. Or is that, uh, or is the collapse inevitable? Uh, in well, I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, I have to tell you that with almost scientific certainty, I mean, I think Hank uh, sort of tried to prove that also, uh, collapse is in some sort of form inevitable. I mean, climate change is here. No, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, it is here. It's not tomorrow, it's here. No? So December was, for instance, the warmest uh, month in Belgium ever. Ever. Um, so, so in Holland, too. yeah. I mean, just so. So I mean, you know, but I mean, you know, but I mean, you know, but it's you know, but I, it, in fact, I, I could only say Belgium because I, I, I you no, know, I mean, it's 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 there. No, it's there. So I mean, the flooding of England, Belgium is now flooded. So so it's it's warm, flooded, droughts. It's there. Yeah, overpopulation is there. Mass migration due to destabilization of the Middle East uh, due to droughts in etc 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 it's all linked mass migration is there I mean even now the, the uh, if I can keep calling them the fuckers of Davos uh, are, are aware of it no so um, uh, it's there it's just there and of course I am not I mean let's not be any misunderstanding I am totally against these fools uh, of accelerationism I think it's a total mess up. There's no what one iota in the manifesto of concrete political steps of what this acceleration will bring us. It is totally abstract. Um, uh, is it is it GMOs? Is that the sort of acceleration they want? Then I say no. I want slow science. I want to slow down. I think the, the what we should do is stop air travel. Stop it. I mean, uh, air travel. Uh, uh, Henk has. Uh, pointed to it also, air travel will become 40% together with, with sea traffic of pollution, uh, CO, C2 uh, emissions. I mean, I don't want to know the total air travel of this audience alone. Knowing that air, one, one flight is uh, a one year warming your house plus driving your car one year. So we have to stop traveling like we have to stop eating meat. I mean, so, and that is slowing down. We have to stop, uh, for instance, uh, when people ask me to go to the other side of the world to give a lecture, I say, let's Skype for half an hour, it will work. And it works very well, because you're on a big screen, you have lots of aura, it works <laughs> very well, and you're absent. So, so I mean, we have to, we have to uh, uh, slow down. Uh, we, we have to stop traveling, we have to stop eating meat, we have to stop uh, being in the rat race. I mean, I gave up the rat race of academia ages ago, and look at me, I'm, st I'm still alive. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a satellite in academia. May I ask a sub-question directly related to this? I mean, because I think uh, the, the arrival of the collapse as such, as you, as you now analyze it, is evident. And also certain concrete actions people can take are quite evident. The big question is then, why are people not doing it? If you look at your slogan, you have uh, maybe it's a slogan of our time would be uh, optimism in theory and apathy in practice. Yes. Um, but that's, you know, that's what people do. Yes, no, no, but, it, so yeah, but it's other people. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I, I, what I wonder then is if you look at the epic figure of uh, how to prepare for a collapse, it's Noah with his ark, mm. right? You build a boat, it's going to come, some people are on, some people are off. Yes. Uh, how, what are ways that we can prepare that are not this 
uh, exclusionary mechanism and are not um, just simply yeah, 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 yeah. change yeah. the system. I mean, for instance, the, the, I mean, we are caught. We we should consume. We are all asked. We are begged to consume because indeed we are in a logic of growth. The logic of growth is not questioned. I mean, give me one article in in a, in a newspaper for the last three years that really questions the logic of growth. As long as the logic of growth is not questioned, that is back to to the Club of Rome. You're you you now the the, the the topos, the location of the Club of Rome. Um, said there is not a possibility of unlimited growth in a finite system, it is not possible. And of course, these prophets of accelerationism believe it is, but they're dreaming, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, accelerationism is a, dece the, the, a very uh, deceiving dream. You cannot accelerate uh, anymore, we have to slow down. For instance, GMOs is a very good example. We have to slow down before we know, and we have to stop privatizing. So it's not only a capitalist, but it's also a technological logic. They could not go quick enough, but we have, I mean, we have no evidence that uh, uh, GMOs are ready for to be in outside there. But um, from your lecture, we get the impression that, let's say, or even from, from most lectures today, we get the impression that uh, a key uh, to solving uh, the crisis is a return to the commons. One of the yes. examples that you gave was, for example, Fab Labs. Now I'm trying to play the, the devil's advocate. It's not black and white. But for example, if you imagine that the chairs that we're sitting on would not be industrially manufactured, but they would be 3 d printed at home uh, uh, in, in, or in your Fab Lab, that's an ecological catastrophe. Actually, 3D printing uh, is just as bad as the move uh, as from, from uh, trains to individual transportation in the early 20th century. So I think the, 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 the answer is not always is not always decentralization. Yeah. I didn't so, say that. Can I can I can I give an answer to that? Yeah, but fat labs are a really bad example. I mean yeah. fat labs are ecological catastrophe. Well I mean yeah but I mean yeah you take one example. I mean it, it is of course I I, I mean th for me this is you, you give me uh, my exercise in speechlessness. Uh, that's one of the problems of today is that but you can intervene, eh? Uh, but I, I'll be ju just short. Um, uh, one of the problems of today is that many of the things that we think are a solution, think of biofuels uh, a few years ago, we thought yes. wonderful, and now uh, we, we know it's a catastrophe. So many, I mean, even, even for instance, uh, my example of Skype, uh, and all, all your, your and my circulationism, the footprint of circulating these poor light images is huge, ecologically, huge. So, so the cloud to keep it up in the air uh, has a huge footprint. So, so and we do as if it's not. So, so I agree. I fully agree. The first thing that we have to learn, kids, is to think in footprints. That's the first thing. So, every time you uh, act, in a way, you have to be in an awareness what all the different elements of this act how they are connected. So most solutions that are offered are more expensive because it takes so much energy or so much traffic. You know, so so the, the whole idea of taking it down to a specific place, a locality, Commons for instance, is not just an ideological idea, it has to do with footprint. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea, we, we can't, in, in French they say, or so, so thinking beyond Earth, we have to get back and materialize again. That's why accelerationism is complete nonsense. We have to get back to the, the material substance that gives you the resistance and gives you the input for thinking about footprint. Yeah. Right? So, so uh, ecology with nature. <laughs> yes. I don't know whether material <laughs> resistance is in nature. Yeah. Okay. okay, but that's a different discussion. So maybe this will be the final question because it's already turning yeah. off. Hey, who, who's yeah. in a hurry? I mean, I, yeah, I, I well, don't know. I am, for example. Oh, you are. Yeah. <laughs> but you can leave. You're, you're free to leave. I mean, yeah, slow down. I mean, I'm not in a hurry. I came specially from Brussels. Okay, it took me two hours and a half to get here. So, I mean, why hurry? So, and, and, and I meet Henk and all these lovely people. So, okay, so I mean, my question sorry. is because everybody is like, okay, stop doing, you have to slow down, you have to slow down. And, because eventually the world is 
just going to be this big thing and um, with the climate changes and stuff and we won't come out of it alive as in there's this there will be nothing else if we keep on going like this but my mom always said to me that um, no matter how bad things go there will always be a point when you have to stand up and just uh, go further so I don't understand why everybody is thinking that um, with the things we are doing currently, so just on keep on going and going and going, that this will be the end. And why this won't be just another process in just the evolution of mankind, that we will find a way that uh, even if things are going really, really bad, that we won't come out of it. But who is we? Yeah, but, I mean, yes. Who is but, we? No, but, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah? So be very concrete. Let's look very, very concretely here. Here, so, uh, 1900, 2000, uh, 2000. So, uh, the middle is here, that's 2000. So, we are sort of, say, here. Yeah? So, at 2000, more or less, there were 6 billion people. Here, there are, again, 6 billion people. That means between 2050 and 2100, 3 billion people dying. So, it's not, it's not let's go on, let's go on, it's, it's hell. <laughs> Sorry, and, and, and not to call it hell is stupid, in my opinion. It is hell. So, of course we will survive hell. The planet will survive everything. Uh, the dinosaurs, humans, I mean, let it come. So, for the planet, no, no problem. Uh, for nature, as a, as a biosphere, big problem. Biodiversity, etc., etc. So, but of course it will, I mean, within millennia, it will say, uh, like the dinosaurs, strange memory. Um, <laughs> Yes, a strange memory. Um, but but uh, so so I think, of course, and, and this is the ethical question, uh, in the sense that we forgot uh, with with the too many questions. Um, but it, you know, it's a very big question. I mean, for me, there is no viewpoint from Mars. From Mars, nothing can happen. Yeah, and and this is of course the Ark of Noah again. Of course, Elon Musk. Um, uh, a few of my friends here, uh, Virgin Guy, uh, I always forget, Richard Branson, and uh, the other uh, uh, charity guy, uh, of course, uh, Bill Gates. Three people who are uh, busy with Mars, flight to Mars. Why? Exactly. They want to save their asses. Yeah? <laughs> and a few others. No, no, but that is what was happening. I think we should sabotage that project. You remain here, you. No, no, I mean, so, so slow down, because of course the footprint of such programs is of course huge. The footprint of getting people to Mars is both in, in, in human capital, in real capital, and in footprint, huge. So stop this nonsense. So, so uh, we really have to um, see uh, the ethical, uh, trying to respond to a few questions that were left, left in the end, the ethical viewpoint, there is no viewpoint from Mars that it, it doesn't, of course, in, in terms of geology, does it? It does, nothing matters. But in terms of politics and ethics, I think uh, um, you have to call a cow a cow and, and a sheep a sheep and a, and, a, and a cat a cat and a catastrophe a catastrophe. Three billion people dying, uh, uh, maybe more, uh, in, in 50 years is unseen in human history. So, so we have to know it, and we have to try and act against it. Because uh, uh, if we are still in the business as usual model, because everybody travels Ryanair, Ryanair should should be smashed, should be criminalized. Ryanair is a living crime. It's 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 uh, subsidized by not paying kerosene. It is subsidized by Charleroi and all the other airports where it lives because it's good for the local economy. And you all take it. I'm sorry. All the youngsters take Ryanair. Stop taking Ryanair because I mean we have this future generation that we have to uh, um, acknowledge as the ethical stance, as the momentum that we have to we have to take into account. Sorry, I'm long. Yeah. So let's take the uh, good questions, stand. long answers. So let's take the eth ethical stance. So we are now comparing everything that we do against this uh, horizon of the collapse. Yeah. There's still another life. They're still not alive. In, in Cryonics, you mean? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the afterlife. That's the afterlife before the new life. But, but there is another life in the sense that you have to think... Uh, well, let's go back to Deleuze and Guattari and their analysis of capitalism. So the moment you are prepared to think about your own life in your own terms and not let your desire be 
determined and produced by capitalism, you can live this other life. So there is not an ultimate criterion for living your life that is ordered by this collapse. There's an ultimate criterion that is based on the relations that you have, concrete relations with concrete people in a concrete common situation. And that's why you take the decisions and that's why you make the choices. And the other things are completely, something completely different. So I don't know why we are talking about ethics in comparison with that. The ethics are made on a very local level with the people that you live. Simple as that. And we're going to die in the end all. That's not a problem. So that's not, collapse is there for everyone. So but why don't we thematize the idea, the ethical idea, that you have to find out what your primary needs really are. What your primary needs really are. And when you start from that angle, something different comes. And then, of course, will it help in the end towards this big problem? But if you don't start on this side of the equation, it won't help. Yeah, but I mean, but of course, today, uh, because I, I realized that uh, today I, I was uh, A, presenting the project, and, and B, talking on collapsology and not on activism. And this is, of course, the. A, a totally different approach that, that of course makes my lecture a bit uh, lop, uh, lopsided, if you want. That, that the sort of the concrete uh, uh, actions, uh, whatever it is, uh, Bugby, uh, Brussels Tribunal, or even this park farm, etc., is of course, as you describe it, it's of course a concrete relation of, of persons and, yeah, and, that's where and goals. Of course, of course. It's experience. But, yes, but uh, I mean, in, in view of this graph and the logic that we know, which remains a logic of growth. Of yeah. course, we have to fight that as well. Yeah, but I mean, it, it is, I, I, I fear, and this was the, the question, how to stop uh, this capitalism um, and, and this overconsumption and this uh, planned obsolescence, which, which is, is there all the time. I mean, uh, in fact, the more we are aware uh, of, uh, uh, that we should go to a, a cyclical economy, the more, because of the logic of growth, we are in a, what we in Dutch call a backward, uh, uh, throwaway society. I mean, when I buy my mobile phone, it's already obsolete. Yes. And it's planned like this. Yeah. It's called innovation. When I hear the word innovation, I really feel like, uh, as Goebbels said, when he heard the word culture, to get out my gun. Because innovation is just a lie. It is, it is, it is another word for planned obsolescence. Yeah. So, so we have to uh, we have to attack the very building stones of the ideology that feeds us. We have just made a book, um, small book called Mount Hygiene for Managers, a small lexicon of the neoliberal newspeak uh, in Dutch, uh, Mount Hygiene for Managers. I hope it will be published soon because, in fact, the battle begins in language in a certain, certain way. We are all uh, 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 contaminated by the thinking in terms of market, win-win operations, winners and losers. I mean, you, we have hundreds of words um, that, that in fact, a business plan, core business, uh, etc. Uh, words that are often used also by activists. My God, that makes me crazy. Uh, so we should attack the, the, the very ideological building stones of the neoliberal ideology. For me, that is a battle for intellectuals. Thank you. Yeah.